No matter where you find yourself on your voyage, there's always an opportunity to embark on this quest. This quest doesn't take much to start, but will change the course of your life. This quest is about the heart, both the brokenness and beauty found within. This quest is about the soul, searching for the spirit. What is important to remember along this voyage is that not all treasure is of silver and gold. In fact, the best treasure is one that can grasp at eternity. This quest is one of prayer. Prayer truly changes things. Prayer invites God to work in special and unusual ways. Join us as we take to the high seas of prayer on a quest for a deeper life with God. Well, good morning, uh, Church on the Rock. Uh, my name is Mike Beecraft, and it's a pleasure to be with you guys uh, again. Honored to uh, be able to serve you guys in this way, and I hope uh, maybe in your jammies, maybe you're comfy on the couch, uh, ready to uh, dive in uh, to the Word of God. Uh, we've been encouraged over the past few weeks uh, to pray, uh, to pray boldly, and to uh, I want to continue uh, that theme this morning. And uh, my title for you is Look and Find. And when I was a kid, I, I would spend hours uh, going through the Look and Find books, the Where's Waldo books, where you go page after page of just these clustered images of all sorts of things going on, and you were looking for that one individual, you're looking for that one item, you're looking for that one animal, you're looking for, maybe you're looking for Waldo, and, and you were going through these books, and, and you, you find all sorts of amazing scenes and funny things going on, uh, but you're looking... You're, you're looking for Waldo. You're looking and you're finding. And once you find Waldo, what do you do? You move on to the next page and continue on the books. And I would go through these books, and of course, I knew where Waldo was, and so I would go and try to find other things that were going on inside of these. You know, I think about, I think about Jesus growing up, and, and he never would have done look and find books because he would always know where Waldo was, and there'd be no fun for him whatsoever. He would just open up a page. Oh, there he is. Next page, oh, there's Waldo. Oh, there, oh, there's Waldo too. And, you know, there would be no fun in looking and finding for Jesus because Jesus doesn't need, he doesn't need to look and find because he's all-knowing. And it's, it's amazing to me, you know, my little brain cannot comprehend that. But David, David prays, and in Psalm 139, and I, I want to highlight for us this morning the beginning of the psalm and the end of the psalm, but I'm going to read the whole thing because... Psalm 139 is absolutely uh, amazing. So let's dive in to Psalm 139 together. David starts out with this. O oh Lord, you have searched me and you have known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search up my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in. Behind and before me, you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where, where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. You formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when yet there was none of them. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, they are more than the sand. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. The men of blood depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. I, I, 
Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? Do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me, know my thoughts, and see if there be any grievous way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting." You know, Psalm 139 opens up with saying, God, you've searched me and you know me, and yet it ends with God, search me and know me. Um, I don't think God, I don't think David is, is praying this way. I don't think he's singing this way because, um, you know, he is trying to ask God if he knows what's going on inside of him. See, he's, David doesn't ask this because he thinks God doesn't already knows the, know these things, but he asked God this because he wants God to reveal to him what's on the inside. See, search me and know my heart, I believe is one of the most boldest prayers that we could pray for ourselves. This is also one of the most unnatural prayers that we could pray. Because our default as humanity is to hide our sin and our ugliness from everyone, especially God. Because if I reveal to you the ugliness of my life, the sin in my life, I set myself up to be rejected. I set myself up to be denied by you, to be hated by you. You know, we don't got to look too far to remember in the garden, what is the immediate response of Adam and Eve when they sin is they run and they hide. They want to run and they want to hide from a God that they know uh, created them, created the garden, knows what's going on. But yet, what do they do? They hide themselves because of their sin. You know, we ask God to know our hearts. The, our heart is the center of what we will and what we desire. It drives all that we do and all that we want to do. That's our heart. So let's just dive into a quick word study and see what the See what the Word of God says about the condition and the state of the human heart. Uh, Jeremiah uh, 17, and, and these are all, by the way, these are all refrigerator verses. You want to take these and you want to pin them up and you want to be encouraged by these daily by looking into these, to these verses. So Jeremiah 17, verse 9. The heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately sick. Who can understand it? Some translations say the heart is deceptive above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? In Genesis chapter 6, verse 5, before the flood, before Noah, it says, And God saw the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. You know, we don't got to look too far in, in the earth to see evil things, and, and we also get to experience goodness and beauty, but I cannot imagine a world where that was true, where the only intent and every intent of the thought of man's heart was only evil continually. Wow. Surely, surely the New, the New Testament is going, to have some, is going to have a Disneyism for us about the heart. So let's be encouraged by Mark 7, verse 20. What comes out, it's what comes out of a person that defiles him. For from within, out of the heart of man. So here we are. Here's the heart of man. Here's what we're talking about. What comes out of it? Surely it's flowers and, and sunshine. Here's what comes out of the heart of a man. Evil thoughts, sexual morality, theft, murder, adultery, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness, water spilled everywhere. <laughs> All these things come from within and they defile a person. So our hearts are not in a good state outside of God. They're not. So when we ask God to look at our hearts, when we say, God, search me and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there's any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. We're asking God to look at the factory of sin in our lives. And, and, and what does a factory produce? The same thing over and over again. What do our hearts produce? 
Outside of God, they produce sin over and over and over again. But surely David asking this, you know, we, 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 we can look at the word of God and see that the track record of David was full of just sinless perfection. He never, all the stories of him were absolutely brilliant and then nothing ever went wrong in David's life. David never committed every, any sort of trespass towards God. Uh, no. Thankfully, uh, my life is not a book in the Bible where you could see the highlights and the lowlights. And, and this is what I love about the word of God. It doesn't paint these heroes of the faith in, in this perfect light. It shows us uh, exactly what they were capable of when they began to trust in their own resources, and that was sin. You know, you don't, you don't got to look far to see that David, it was, his life was ridden with all kinds of ugliness. Yes, he had his successes, and we see that displayed in Scripture. See, he didn't ask God to search him in Noah's heart because he, he thought God would only find goodness. God, tell me all the good things about me. Tell me all the great aspects of my character. No. Although that's there, he knew exactly what God would find. He knew exactly what God would find, but he asked God anyway. See, that's boldness. You know, I've been married to my wife for 15 years, and, and I love being married. I love my wife, but I guarantee you, if I were to ask her, uh, hey, babe, is there anything in our marriage that I could do better? I don't ask that question too often because I'm not sure I want the answer. <laughs> but she would have an answer for me. She, it might take her some time to think through the list of what she'd want to highlight uh, in, this, in this question to be answered. But that takes boldness. Or you say to your employer, hey, I, you know, I think I'm a decent employee, but is there any ways that I, that I could improve in, 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 in how I'm doing? Or talk to your kids. If you really want an interesting answer, ask your kids, hey, I have two daughters. Hey, is, is there any way that I could be a better dad to you? I'm sure I would get an answer. They might think a little while. It might be a little bit selfishly motivated. It might show the, the heart of a child a little bit. But that would be a, that, that's a bold ask. So we ask God, God, look at, the, look at the sin factory of our hearts. Well, what now? What now? See, at this point, the sermon can go one of two ways. I can encourage you to try hard. You got this sin factory right inside of you. Try hard. Put in some good effort. Tap into the, the grit that you have inside of you and, and push yourself to become better. The sermon could go that, down that road. And I could give you a list of things that you could do. So I, I see I could encourage you to try harder or I could encourage you to trust Christ. And man, I, my desire for the body of Christ, and, and not just for you at Church of the Rock, but my desire for the body of Christ is that, is that we would go the distance. I mean, the Apostle Paul says, I have run the race. Like he, he says, I have finished the course. That's why that's I want all of our lives to end. I want us to go the distance. It breaks my heart when people get burnt out in Christianity. And I'm, and I'm, and I'm wondering, I'm like, what, what Christianity are you in? Christianity shouldn't be this exhaustive lifestyle where we're just burning out. Jesus, one of Jesus' calls is, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So I can encourage you, try hard or trust Christ. And man, I want you, I want to point you to Christ this morning. I want to point you to Jesus this morning, because the result of this bold prayer can sometimes be disheartening. It can sometimes be discouraging if we don't understand and we don't trust Christ first. See, David prayed this prayer. David prayed for an answer that he would never see in his lifetime. He prays at the very end of Psalm 139 in verse 24. He says, lead me in the way everlasting. David is going to live and David is going to die without ever experiencing the way everlasting. See, in the Old Testament, the uprightness and the righteousness of an individual's heart was maintained and it was judged and it was measured by their, by their obedience to God's law. That's how it was measured. You look at a lot of times in Scripture, it's like, if you do this, then God will do that. If you do this, then it will be good. It was a checklist and then we would get, then this would be the result. It was measured by our individual obedience to the law. But there was a time coming that David had not yet experienced 
when the righteousness of man, when the uprightness of the human heart would not be measured by my obedience to the, to the law or by your obedience to the law, but it would be measured by Christ's obedience to the law. Like that, that is incredibly good news. That is, that is liberating, that is empowering, that is encouraging all at the same time. That God isn't looking down on your life and going, how have you done this week? And I will now base your righteousness on that. Well, well, you yelled at your kids, you got in a fight with your wife, you kind of slacked off a bit at work, you, you know, you're, you're, you're driving and, and the way, oh, I, oh, the words that came out of your mouth. Oh, not even that. How about, the, how about the intents of your heart? How about the thoughts that would have crossed through your head? Like, it, the, it, if we tried to live in that way, and if, if we were always in this place where we had to perform for God, we would constantly find ourselves lacking. We would find ourselves uh, discouraged. But I want to take you to Ezekiel 36. Because again, this is before the, the way everlasting has arrived. And hint, who, who, is, who, who described himself as the way? It was Jesus. Jesus is the way everlasting. Jesus comes and he says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through me. So when David prays, God, lead me in the way everlasting, what was that way? It was Jesus. And David had yet to experience all the goodness that Jesus would come and what Jesus would accomplish on our behalf. Ezekiel uh, chapter 36, verse 22. Therefore I say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord of God, it is not for your sake, O house of Israel, that I'm about to act. It is not for your sake that I'm about to do something, but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations, to which you came. I will vindicate the holiness of my great name, which you have profaned among the nations and which you have profaned among them. And the nations will know that I am the Lord God, declares the Lord God, when through you I will vindicate my holiness before their eyes. I will take you from the nations and I will gather you from all the countries and I will bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness." And from all your idols, I will cleanse you. And I will give you a new heart. A new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. And I will cause you to walk in my statutes. And be careful to obey my rules. And you shall dwell in the land that I will give to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your God. I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness, and I will summon grain and make it abundant and lay no famine upon you. See, I love Ezekiel 36 because God didn't look down on the house of Israel and say, wow, you guys are crushing it down there. I'm going to, you know what? <laughs> just because you're doing so good, just because you've got to this place where you've just really nailed it, I'm going to come down and I'm going to do something great. I'm going to come down and I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to do everything that my word says, and I'm going to sprinkle you with clean water. I'm going to, I'm going to take all your uncleanliness. I'm going to remove from you all your idols. I'm going to cleanse you. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to put my spirit within you. Wow, guys, because you got it together. He says, no, that's not. It's not because they were good enough, but it was because of God's grace. And that's the same situation for you and for me. God did not save us. God did not call us to where we are today. He did not rescue us and redeem us from the kingdom of darkness and transfer us in the kingdom of light because we had it all going on, because we were really doing life well. But he did it because God is going to make his name great. He's going to proclaim his holiness. He's going to pro pro proclaim his goodness and his grace to the world. And he does that by rescuing broken humanity. Not because we are good enough. See, God is in the business of changing hearts. And your heart is not something that can be changed by sheer will. Just try hard and you can change your heart. It's not how it is. It's a work of the spirit of God. 
It's a work of the Spirit. See, right after our, our bold prayer of search me and know me, see if there's any wickedness in me, try my thoughts, test my heart, comes a very humbling prayer, which is, Spirit, have your way in me. Spirit of God, have your way in me. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 10, or sorry, verses 8 to 10. It says this, For by grace you have been saved, through faith. This is not your own doing. We need to make that really clear for people. It is not by our own doing that we are saved. It is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, this is not an instruction to try hard to keep your heart pure. But this is an instruction to trust, to trust Christ and the work of his, that His Spirit is doing in your life. See, when we placed our faith in Jesus, we were given a new heart. And let that new heart that God has placed in you rule and reign over those old desires. Now we think, okay, well, now has to come the try hard. Now has to come the effort. Now has to come the direction. But my encouragement is yield your heart to him and walk beside the good shepherd. You know, one of my favorite portions of scripture is in John chapter 10, when it describes the type of good shepherd Jesus is over his sheep. He knows you. He knows you by name. He goes before you. He calls you out. He, he goes ahead of you. He walks beside you. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. We, we sung about that this morning. We're never giving up. Why? Because we know God is never giving up on us. And we simply need to yield our hearts to him. You know, you can kind of think of the word yield in two ways. If you're a driver, you know what that big upside down triangle means with the red border. That means yield. And that means if you're about to enter and you see someone else is already doing their thing, you slow down, you stop, you let them go, you yield so they can go ahead of you. And that is the same with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is living and active in our lives. And we, it, we just need, need to simply acknowledge, oh, here's the Holy Spirit in my life and I just need to yield. I just need to slow down and I just need to let the Holy Spirit get out ahead of me. Or maybe, think, maybe some of you think of the word yield in a battle context, in, in a fighting context. You're in the middle of a battle. And one of the, one of the persons on the side of the battle realized things are not going their way. They are not winning this battle, so they decide in the middle of the battle to yield themselves and to give up. They throw their hands up, I give up, I yield. They drop their weapons, they yield. And depending on where we're at in our hearts, that maybe, maybe one of those two kind of resonate with you. Maybe it's a matter of, okay, I need to slow down. I need to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit is in my life. Jesus says, it's to your advantage that I go because I will send to you the helper, the Holy Spirit, who will be with you and in you forever. He's there all the time. We don't got we don't, we don't, we don't to... Go visit the Holy Spirit. We don't got to sit down and, and meet up with the Holy Spirit somewhere. No, where is he? With you and in you forever. See, maybe it's a matter of just acknowledging him and yielding, slowing down. Holy Spirit, go ahead of me. Because our default is, let me get ahead of you. Maybe I'm just more reflective of my driving. Uh, <laughs> my driving is, let me get ahead of you. You are too slow for me. Let me pass you. 
That line is dotted. Let me just do a little quick go around here and let's go. I was on my way to Hamilton this morning from Kitchener. I can tell you I was guilty of that several times, several times on my way here. I made it in good time, but maybe that resonates with you or maybe, maybe you're fighting. Maybe you're fighting the Holy Spirit and you need just to simply drop, set your weapons down and say, I yield. Holy Spirit, have your way. I'm reading from the uh, ESV, and I want to uh, close by reading. I'm just going to shamelessly rip off the footnotes here <laughs> because I think, honestly, it was so, it's so beautiful and it's so encouraging to me. It says, the new life that the gospel brings is not a new set of clever strategies, or it's not spiritual rehab, or fresh resolve to live in a new way out of our old resources. It is an utterly new and foreign impartation of divine power that changes us at the very core of who we are. We are changed from the inside out. It is a transformation so profound that even our very desires are changed. Remember how I define the heart. It's, it's our desire. It's what we will to do. That even our very desires are changed. The Bible calls this regeneration or new birth or being born again. See, so many of us in life, we just want that next clever strategy. We just want that. Just Mike, just tell me three things I got to go do. I will go do them. I will check those boxes and God will look down on me and smile and I'll be happy. Some of us want just the, the freshest, most current information. Just, Mike, just give me the life hack and I will move on. I'll apply it. I'll do it. I'll, I'll cut my milk bag that way or I'll get this new wallet or whatever it is that needs to change my life or make it easier in some shape or form. I'm going to do that. It is not just a new way living out of old resources. The gospel is good news because it's not us getting ourselves right on the inside and, and figuring it out for ourselves and then suddenly now, oh, okay, I'm good enough for God. No, it is, the gospel is, it's an, it's an exterior message of the goodness of Jesus coming to us and now his spirit is living within us. That our very desires are changed. I have been, I placed my faith in Christ at the age of, of 17. I'm, I'm 37, it's been 20 years I've been I've had the spirit of God living on the inside of me. And I do, I do not want to know, and I really have no way of knowing the type of person that I would have been on this day. I probably wouldn't have been here with you. I can guarantee that. I don't think David would be like, hey, let's get this, uh, let's get this unsaved guy to come bring the message on Sunday morning. Can't imagine that uh, ever popping into the, to the mind of a pastor leading a church. But I... I can't even begin to imagine or even know where I would be, who I would be without the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. You know, I was encouraged uh, earlier this week when somebody was saying, you know what, farmers don't grow, they don't grow grain. They don't grow wheat. They don't do that. They don't go out there and, oh, and all of a sudden, there it is. Ah, it sprouted. No, what do they do? They prepare the soil. They prepare the ground so that the seed will bring forth the harvest. And that's what it's like yielding to the Holy Spirit, preparing that ground so that the Holy Spirit, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, is going to spring forth in our life because God has given us a new heart, because God has given us new desires. And we just simply have to yield. And we have to yield to Him. But let me pray. I want to pray for us because I'm, I'm the same way, man. I want to do it in my own strength. I want to do it from my own resources. I want to do it from my own energy, grit, and strength. If you try to live the Christian life that way, you'll be exhausted. You'll be burdened. You'll burnt out. You'll throw your hands up in the air and you go, you know what? I tried Christianity. It doesn't work. <laughs> Let me tell you, Jesus never fails. Jesus never sins. Jesus accomplishes the work. 
Jesus is the word of God. And guess what the word of God does? The word of God accomplishes what it was set forth to do. You don't try Christianity and it doesn't work. If that's your perspective of the Christian life, let me tell you, you're doing it wrong because you're focused on your doing. You need to focus on what Christ has accomplished. Allow him to empower our lives. Allow that spirit. I love this in Ezekiel 36. It says, I will remove a heart of flesh, or I will remove, sorry, the heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. Nobody has ever performed heart surgery on themselves, ever. You, you want to try it by all means? Grab, grab the scalpel and give it a go. Please don't do that. Don't try this at home. What does he say? I will remove the heart. I will give you a new heart. I will put my spirit within you. And even this, 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 this hurts my brain a little bit, and this rubs my, rubs my uh, heart, the, my sinful heart the wrong way. It says, and I will cause you to walk in my, I will cause you to walk in my statutes, and I, and I will cause you to carefully obey my rules. Well, wait, 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 I thought, carefully, I thought careful obedience was all on me, Lord. No, it's the Holy Spirit in you, unpacking his fruit in you. Let me pray real quick. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit that is within us. God, as we boldly pray, and we want to boldly pray, search us and know us, O God. And when we are confronted with the ugliness of our sin, Jesus, we would simultaneously and overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly be confronted with the beauty of our Savior and the power of the Holy Spirit that is with us and in us forever, that you have given us your spirit to live within us, that you said, we will be your people and you will be our God. Deliver us, O oh God. Help us to yield to you this morning and to trust Christ and not just simply try hard. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, welcome back, Church on the Rock. Um, uh, Mike, thank you so much. By the way, today was a really good reminder about yielding. Um, we had a question come in, and I just want to bring it up. Um, and somebody asked, so God knows all that is in our heart, the Holy Spirit is within us forever once we are saved. So do we um, need to pray boldly, search me and know me every day? So that's a great question. Yeah, yeah, it really is. Because there's this contrast of, and, and you know, some people may, you know, disagree with the fact that we are, um, you know, sinner and saint simultaneously. Um, but I think we if we're honest with ourselves, we still recognize that we sin, you know, <laughs> daily. Yep. <laughs> um, and, and I think if we see the bigness of the law, if we look at the, the law for what it is, and then we look at the law as to how Jesus really turned it up to 11, mm -hmm. he's like, oh, you, you know, you've heard it said, don't murder. Well, I say, if you hate, you've murdered. And we're like, what? Everyone in the yeah. audience must have been like, well, who then is capable of, of keeping this law? Right. No one. No one. Really. And so we know that while we're on planet Earth, yes, we have the Holy Spirit. He, I love that the Holy Spirit is referred to as, you know, our seal. Uh, mm -hmm. he, he preserves us and, until, you know, we get to be mm -hmm. on the new heaven and the new earth. Yeah. Uh, but until that time comes, you know, you have the Apostle Paul, uh, who I don't even begin to compare myself to, uh, prayed, oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death. I thank God. And, but the prayer doesn't end there, right? It right. doesn't end with saying how wretched he is. It ends with, but I thank God. It's through Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. So... That's our prayer on this earth, is that we realize there are those wretched parts of our hearts, but yet we got mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah. And, you know, that's why the Word of God says, you know, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that, that you may be healed. Because we don't want to confess. We want to hide <laughs> and we want to keep it to ourselves. Yeah. And, oh, maybe I'll just tell God about this. Yeah. And, or maybe I won't even tell God about this. Uh, but that's so needed because we need... We want to live this life in full understanding what the gospel actually means, right. and that comes with that confession, and totally. that comes with there's an unhealthy power that comes when we keep things secret. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. In the stronghold. Yeah. Yeah. I love. Yeah. I love that. Um, well, before we end, we have a couple. One of the, this last little piece is a time for us to kind of have. I was going to say growth opportunities, but I love what you said. It's not growth opportunities. It's really opportunities for our church to prepare the ground for Jesus to do growth. So I, when you were saying that, I'm like, yeah, that's really good. That's really good. Um, so a couple of those are um, coming up. We, have, we were going to have a prayer summit um, this Saturday, but it actually, unfortunately, is postponed. Um, and so you can keep your eye on Facebook for that. But before I move on to the next thing, I actually want to 
kind of stay on that for a second. Um, Mike, I just, I really enjoyed some of the things that you said about the importance of trusting Christ and the importance of yielding to him. Um, and so uh, kind of a bit of a, actually a question with this uh, growth, growth opportunity. Um, even though we don't have prayer summit this week, what could people do? Is there any, like, any posture somebody can take this next week um, in prayer? And like, what does that look like to yielding? Like, so like, let's right. say somebody in the audience, you know, set an hour aside or even like at night before they go to bed, they're like, okay, God, I just need to yield. What would a yielding look like? Yeah. And that's, you know, I think we all, yielding starts with the acknowledgement that there is one ahead of me. So in the driving example, somebody ahead of me, I'm going to yield, I'm going to stop. That's the Holy Spirit. And so, you know, for me, it comes with an acknowledgement of like, Holy Spirit, you're here. And, you know, there, there are, we act differently when certain people are in the room, you know, just depending, yeah, right? Especially totally. as kids or whatever. And, but it's like, but yet we acknowledge like, man, if, if, if we were aware that the presence of God was mm. not just in the room over there, you know, on some mm. laptop or something or yeah. texting on their phone, the Holy Spirit is right here. Yeah. Then I think that it, it's an acknowledgement of, yeah, like he's, he's with me. Mm. And, and acknowledging that then just spending time with the Holy Spirit because mm. it's, it's acknowledging the Holy Spirit that is the, that is the first step to yielding because yeah. we've got to acknowledge, oh, there's somebody that is to go ahead of me. Yeah. There's somebody that is to be guiding and directing me. There, there's somebody, there is that, that could be drawing on for empowerment yeah. in every single situation and every single day. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, like, because yielding is a posture. Mm. It's not so much as like an effort. Like, I don't, it's yeah. not an effort for me just to take my foot off the gas and lightly hit the brake. I don't think, whoo, yeah. that was some tough yielding. <laughs> You know, and then it's even in, even in the fighting analogy, it's yeah. to to give up and to lay down my weapons mm. and to cease fighting. That's easy to do, right? But it's also dangerous if we if if we think the other person on, on the side of this battle doesn't have our best interest in heart. Because mm-hmm. if I drop my weapons, guess what yeah. I'm going to get? Yeah. I'm going to get killed. I'm yeah. going to get stabbed. I'm going to get whatever. But then it, that's where the trust comes. It's like no, mm-hmm. Jesus isn't here to whack us over the head right. as we just prayed. Like he, he loves extending mercy yeah. and his mercies are new every morning. Yeah. And we're and it's supposed like, to run to him. When we drop our weapons, I'm not fearful of uh, what comes, but I'm like, Oh God, mm. maybe cease from my fighting. I realized why was I even fighting you in the first place? Yeah. You're the creator of all things. So yeah, that, I think that would be a great posture. It's just this acknowledgement. And, Cause I think, I think that is, and again, there's other answers out there, I'm sure, and I know there is, but I think for me, that's a big piece. Mm. That's the first step in the yielding is just acknowledging yeah. the presence is there. I love that. That's cool. Well, I'm hopeful that some of you guys can have those moments this week of, of yielding. <laughs> um, and to do that, I think even before our next prayer summit would be really cool to come into a prayer space where you have already yielded. <laughs> You've already spent that time. Uh, love you guys so much. Have an amazing week. And we'll see you next week, hopefully in person.